Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another podcast. What has been keeping analysts busy 24 by 7 the last two years? It has been AI. Surprise. And like with any inflection, right? It didn't start this year, didn't start last year, it started years ago, but we are progressing at delivering real business and consumer value. It has become a real thing. It's a trend, not a fad. Part of the build out though has been very challenging. Uh, recent reports say 85% of cloud giants CapEx expenditures are GPUs. And latest reports, and I can vouch for them, looks that data center power is gonna double by the year 2026. What are we gonna do about this? We've definitely hit an inflection point. Uh, one of the companies trying to help out with this power and efficiency problem is Untether AI. I have the CEO, Chris Walker, with me. Chris, great to see you again. Great to be with you, Pat. We've done so many of these, and it's so encouraging to be able to do this in new territory like like AI that, you know, us old timers, it's, you know, it's fascinating new stuff. You know, isn't it crazy? I mean, the first AI algorithms were literally created in the 1960s. We didn't have the the uh, acceleration. We didn't have the storage. We didn't have the memory to actually even start delivering on them about 15 years ago. Uh, then University of Toronto, uh, a lot of research, found a way to leverage accelerators to do object recognition. And machine learning then led to deep learning. And here we are with generative AI, but you know, as we've seen, just because something new comes along doesn't mean that all the other iterations aren't in full use. And in fact, generative AI is actually a pretty small portion of it as machine learning uh, moves on. So yeah, it's fun and it's great to see you. You know, I, uh, you and I met uh, when you were uh, at Intel, both of us were, you know, my prior life. I don't think we met, but I'm sure we intersected somehow, but it's, it's great to see you, man. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, you know, going from the, you know, competing across PowerPoints and marketing messages to, you know, collaborating and all the fun stuff uh, that uh, I did in my later years at, at Intel, you know, just been, you know, always a great voice and, you know, critical uh, analysis of what's happening uh, in markets and especially in semis, which is, you know, who would have thought that chips and semis would be so hot now uh, from a standpoint of attention and people trying to understand. So, you know, being with you to help you know, explain that and extend that out to your audience is fantastic. So Chris, um, you spent 30 years at Intel and now you're at a, an AI startup, Untether AI. For those who may not be familiar with the company, first of all, why did you join and what does the company do? What problem are you incrementally solving out there? Yeah. So I was uh, kind of happily retired from Intel and then uh, by way of you know, starting to work uh, in, in consulting and, and working with different companies, uh, Untether AI came to my attention and really, you know, a unique and cool opportunity where, you know, I would say, you know, Pat, we saw like multiple different big changes in, in the compute industry through our careers, right? Workloads moving from, you know, into the desktop, into mobile, um, you know, from, you know, text to GUI, right? We're that old, or at least I am. Um, you know, the uh, I'm there, 1990, Mark, first, uh, uh, sorry, Chris, first job. So yeah. I'm with you. Uh, you know, the architecture, you know, battles and shifts that happen, uh, you know, X, the rise of x86, the rise of ARM uh, with, with mobility and the Internet of Things, uh, you know, the rise of GPUs, first in first in graphics, now in, uh, in AI and in training especially. And then, you know, the things that are happening in the ecosystem, how things get built. Um, you know, new technologies, chiplets, right? All that is now actually in one place. And, you know, Untether, I think, was uniquely uh, positioned to capitalize on all those kind of what have been career generational changes that are actually stacked on top of each other. And that was like super exciting, super compelling to kind of get me off the sailboat and, and, and back, back into business. Um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, Toronto. Actually, I'm in Toronto uh, Speaking to you from Toronto today, it's where our headquarters is because there's been such a hotbed of talent. But one of the things that's interesting, as you said, you know, 15 years ago, uh, the ML algorithms, the you know, vision and object detection networks start coming in. 
they're all, and even today, have been running on a traditional GPU architecture that's a couple decades old. Yeah. And for us, we think the mandate is, and why we were formed is, we need to build the right architectures for the workload of the future, which is it, which is AI. And it needs to be done in a way that's fast, accurate, and most importantly, uh, energy efficient. And that's been the core of you know our approach is taking an app memory architecture approach to really change the bottlenecks, uh, to really address you know the biggest thing that's an impediment to us all enjoying and you know being able to achieve the promise of what AI has, just power. Yeah, and. You know, as we've seen in different iterations, actually, there's even sub iterations of AI the last uh, 15 years, but there, there are two worlds, right? There's the training uh, of the frameworks or the models, and, and then you have the inference actually running it. And a, as you're, it becomes part of an application. AI isn't, isn't an application. Applications leverage AI uh, to do this. Uh, can you? maybe turn up the contrast ratio uh, between the training world and, and the inference world and, and talk about uh, where, where untethered AI plays. Yeah. So I think in the, in the training world, which has been you know, really the dominant story for the last couple, couple of years about the CapEx build out, you know, it's brute force of, you know, thousands upon thousands of, of, you know, servers, uh, gigawatts of power, uh, massive amounts of, of water to cool these things, you know, months and months to train, to train, a, to train a model. Um, that's a certain, you know, capital and operation and, and computational requirement. What inference is about is it's about the next hundred billion dollar market that builds on top of training as we deploy this in the real world, as we deploy this in, you know, applications that you, you see and experience, whether it's autonomous driving, um, you know, from a car standpoint, from your running language model queries to things that actually are impacting industry in effectiveness behind the scene. You know, the recycler using object detection to uh, recycle materials faster, more efficiently, higher accuracy, uh, agricultural tech and farming uh, is coming in, coming into play. So this is really when AI, hit, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And what people care about as we deploy these models isn't not only what it enables from a cool factor, but it also has to be done effectively and efficiently to impact the bottom line um, and to actually do it at scale. And that's where we feel that having the right architecture to process very fast throughput with energy efficiency uh, comes into play because people are form factor constrained. Right. Uh, not every enterprise that runs on premise wants to infinitely build out, you know, data centers or go to liquid cooling, right? These are the things that matter as these things get deployed at real scale. Yeah, I'm grinning uh, uh, when you talked about liquid cooling. I mean, to me, liquid cooling, in my experience, has always been the 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 you hit the end of the road, and whether that was water cooling a desktop uh, a gaming gpu or even in data centers that's kind of where your your architecture has 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 run into something and typically it's hey you add water to get something more out of it not necessarily the baseline but in a way i feel like the industry uh, is moving to where just to get that baseline uh increase from let's say prior generation I'm going to have to hit water. That is an indication to me that something uh, is 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 a miss here. And I always like to think of um, these transitions in terms of the quadrangle, which is you have compute, uh, you have memory storage, and networking. And in what what are what is the current uh, bottleneck? I think we have a few of them, but certainly efficiency is there. Can you explain though technologically the difference between uh, let's say, you know, a training solution and an inference solution, because some companies say, hey, uh, you should do training and inference uh, on the same uh, uh, giant GPU. And really what we see is in the traditional GPU type architecture, the energy um, is basically going to waste as you move to inference by the movement of the data. 
right? So in the movement from, from memory into the computation, because it's very, you know, when you deploy it, when you're doing inference, it is about the speed of the, co the computation. It is about the throughput, um, because that's how you experience it. That's how you experience it, right? Yeah. How long did it take to get the token back? How fast did I process the image? How many networks of signals or imagery can I do you know, at the same time? So everything wants to be highly parallelized, which we are, right? You know, over 1,400, you know, customers, five processors, you know, in, in, in our design as an example. But what you see in a traditional architecture is you've got this bottleneck of memory trying to come into the, into the chip, going through a cache to then be distributed to all the different process, processing elements or ALUs, depending on what you want to call them. What we've done is we've put the computation and the memory together hence at memory. Right. And what that does is allows you to more effectively map the, the algorithms or the, ne the network onto the chip and reduce the bottleneck, reduce the amount of energy with, that's traditionally put in just moving the data into the chip to process. You know, you can look in certain inference workloads up to 90% of the energy consumed by the chip is just in data movement. So we turn that on its head and say, let's start by putting uh, the data, the memory, the computation together, and then more effectively and efficiently pull uh, pull what we need for larger networks in from in from memory. And that's a and that's a game changer where you get the best of both worlds of that speed throughput with lower lower power because you're utilizing the cores and you're utilizing the memory at much higher, much more efficient rates. And so that saves a lot of time, saves a lot of bottleneck, some cases saves you and the amount of memory actually you need uh, in the chip or the module as a starting point. I appreciate that. And by the way, go on Untether AI's website. There are white papers and technological descriptions that uh, do the double click that if you are uber geek, uber nerd, uh, you will love I'd uh, love things. to tell you about 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 the data types and you know how we're native in FP8 and FP16 support. All that stuff is um, you know white papers and happy to connect directly. Yeah. So, Chris, just to make this uh, let's say more real, it, it, should we expect Untether AI solutions to be let's call it uh, at, at the commercial edge, right? Which could be you know a retail store, uh, a factory floor. Or is this in a, a a traditional data center or or somewhere else? Where, where should we? What are you targeting from a, uh, a a location standpoint? From a market and location standpoint, we're on our second generation uh, chip, our Speed AI family, it's particularly well suited for kind of heavier edge vision networks. Um, so you'll th see see that family come into things like. Industry 4.0 applications were, you know, high speed, very detailed, uh, you know, like metrology inspection. Uh, areas of, you know, smart cities or ag tech, uh, where we can replace what people are doing in multiple boards, you know, multiple applications, and have the computational density uh, to do it on, on our in our solution. And where that's important is it's not just the the density or reducing the footprint of how many different solutions you need. What we're actually seeing from customers is they have form factor uh, right. constraints on the edge. You know, I can only have so much, so big of a box in the machine or the application, but they want to be able to upgrade the capability, run, you know, more cameras at higher resolution and process those in real time, uh, integrate the autonomous driving and a tractor with you know, the weeding mechanism, be it pesticide or actually lasers, all that matters where they can run it at higher and higher speeds to get the, the efficiency out of their AI solution, get efficiency out of the automation. And that's where we come in, where we can provide them, you know, five, six, eight X performance and performance power benefits, which are really game changers for how they think about the models what they can do with AI, it kind of really unleashes, uh, untethered, if you will, uh, their expectations on on what AI can do for them in their workflows. And so we see that today. I think where we see the efficiency of at memory and this reduction of 
the memory bottleneck and the energy usage will also apply in things like enterprises will want on natural language processing and things like chatbots, um, financial fraud detection, you know, speeding that up, uh, you know, and we see in data center applications as well for generative solutions where that power performance compute density ratio really matters as you're deploying it. Uh, we think our spatial architecture and app memory compute has a very, very good advantage in, the, in that as well. Not massive scale training, but specifically inference acceleration as you're deploying the models. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous need for that. I just got back from Mobile World Congress a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, aside from the typical, how do we monetize 5G, there was a, I spent most of my time talking about edge compute and the insatiable need. And, you know, we both seen through history, I mean, compute naturally moves to the point of data collection. That's just historically been true. I mean, that, that was true from going from mainframes to minis. That was true going from minis to x86 servers to then to PCs and smartphones. And not that we've gotten rid of any of them, right? right. Technology is always about ands. Maybe we got rid of minis, uh, but there is a lot of RS-400 still uh, uh, sitting out there in power computers. Um, it, it, that's just what happens with history because it's, it's more economical. And if you can manage the distributed, the disaggregated compute, which we have the tools today to do, uh, typically, you know, we have a common container, right, for applications. Uh, you can manage on the edge. Uh, there are companies that are doing uh, uh, edge rollouts where you don't even need to have a technological person. They just need to know where to plug it in. Uh, and and how to put the networking together, and they turn it on, and it's it's literally uh, it works out of the box. And these are these applications uh, like video analysis, people counting, security cameras, uh, basically industrial IoT uh, web uh, 4.0. So uh, yeah, and then in, in, yeah. in the cases, you know, especially on autonomous vehicle, when we're talking about higher levels, you know, level four ADAS. You, the other thing is it's more uh, you know efficient. Uh, cost effective, but you know, in some cases, you can't stream it from the cloud. You can't right. afford that latency, and that's really the big thing. Is we're talking about you know intelligence at the edge. We're talking about a level of learning and decision making that can't tolerate um, high latency, and so it requires that compute uh, to be closer to the data, to be closer to the stream of information. I want to make sure that I've captured uh, the uniqueness of the company and the advantages that it, that it has out there. There's a lot of companies making promises out there. In fact, you know, some companies five or six years ago that have burned through hundreds and millions of dollars uh, in funding, right? And, and driving, you know, have very little uh, uh, to show for it. Uh, you talked about an architectural advantage. Can you, can you double click just what are the advantages to take advantage of this inference uh, opportunity? Yeah, so the, the key advantage is we put the data and the memory together with the, with the compute element. So our processing elements, we put the memory on chip with, with the processor. So we've got the data as close to the compute as possible. And what that does is reduces the amount of energy you're burning, you know, whether it's power, which matters in a you know, battery operated type you know, autonomous vehicle or a form factor constraint where the, you know, the, the other side of the power is the heat generated people can't tolerate that, um, has real advantage of reducing up towards 90% just that data traffic movement. At the same time, you know, we talk about speed or throughput. It needs to be done with accuracy. So we do this at very high accuracy levels based on our processing elements and based on the data types that we support. You know, smaller batch sizes, uh, those are the types of things in these edge use cases uh, that are high, highly valued. And the big thing that we've also innovated around is how we move data around the chip, right? We have a, you know, a very innovative uh, network on chip that doesn't create the bottlenecks, allows, yeah. the, allows the banks, allows the processing elements to shuffle data much more effectively than you see in other, in other solutions. It's great, you can visit the website and see just kind of the pictorial of all that. Um, and so that also translates into you know, we, we sell at a chip level, at a card level, on uh, the future at a chiplet level, we're members of things like UCIE, standards-based 
uh, which I really think is the future of how we're going to partner and develop more advanced solutions uh, across industry players. So we're super excited about, about that as well. And our spatial architecture is very well suited to configurability and working. You know, we are an, a, an inference accelerator working with different you know, processor types and different applications. The other side of it is like, we're, you know, Pat, you and I, we're all, you know, you know, chip heads and semi guys, it's the software. You know, yeah. the big, the big differentiation is, you know, we're a five year young company. We're our second generation of Silicon. Most importantly, uh, you know, over half my engineering is in software. It is our Imagine SDK that enables people to take their trained models and move it into our architecture on an easier, on an easy flow. Enables them to do, if they want to do optimizations all the way down to the metal, they can, but most importantly is they get the performance by porting their model over and a smooth push button, push button flow. Big investment in kernels and compilers to and the old tool chain to do that. So that's a big, you know, as we talk with our customers, as we go to do this, de you know, deployment of inference on a larger scale, the training's still going to happen in a big data center. It's still right. going to happen on a GPU architecture. We work very hard and very focused on the software to enable people to then use the better and more optimal architecture to deploy those models. And that's you know a big differentiator in our journey as well is doing those together as one as one product. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the the software piece. I mean, and it's the software not just to even optimize uh, what's in front of you, but also has to respect what's coming in from the training that might be uh, done on somebody else's uh, GPU. And it just makes sense that, that an accelerator uh, would do this three times, four times, 10 times better and 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 more uh, efficient. It, it really makes sense. So I have to ask, there's been a lot of talk uh, about funding, right? Yeah. Uh, we... You know, I mean, you see the massive run up of of NVIDIA's uh, market capitalization. And then there are players around that which either do something similar or they're a network working company like a Broadcom and a Marvell. Uh, but then you've got, you know, Sam Altman. He he walked back the seven trillion dollar uh, fund yeah, for that. for AI, but he didn't put a number on it. OK. Uh, and then you've got, you know talks about soft bank, soft bank and a hundred billion dollar uh, of fun. I mean, I have to ask, what do you think uh, it takes to field a market leading AI accelerator? Uh, and where are you on this journey? Are you asking for $7 trillion? <laughs> I think the common joke for everybody is we'll do it for, we'll do it for half. Um, I've it, seen that. And that is a funny, funny meme, right? Yeah. It's, it's good. Look, I think the, you know, there's been the, Hundred odd billion spent to date on on training infrastructure. You know, over the next couple of years, there's going to be you know, it's going to shift not shift away from training. There's going to be an additive of upwards of a hundred billion uh, spent on the deployment on the on the inference hardware. So that's just starting to be the consumption part on typical silicon hardware. Then you look at the economics of what you need, data center infrastructure, power, etc., to go go fuel all that. You start getting in the fabs to build it. You do start getting in those really, really, you know, big, big numbers. Um, for us, and what I think it takes, you know, the market opportunity is very clear. I don't know that we would all look back and go, well, you know, the the web or the internet was, you know, wasn't worth it, right? You know, right. And you know, and a lot of it, it's going to be the case, just like the internet allowed companies, large and small, to reach global. I think the AI tools um, are going to enable small companies to compete looking large. Um, and it's going to allow people to, at the edge, to be much more efficient and effective uh, with, with their industrial products. For us, you know, as a startup, you know, playing in the space, opportunity is massive. What it takes to compete and what it takes is you're always designing, you're always working with partners to bring in, you know, new IP, tape outs. So, you know, Silicon itself is always, even as a startup, you know, designing in a, in a fabulous way, is still very capital intensive. And what we see is the great pull for 
you know, our products and saying, well, can you do derivatives? Can you, you know, and that's the very interesting thing about our architecture. It's very configurable. So we're able to do you know, different spins of it for different applications, different, you know, memory types that people want, uh, we think very effectively. And so, you know, us like others, you're always kind of in the market trying to, you know, continue to scale up. And that's really where we're the inflection point of second generation product, uh, you know, in hand, you know, this year sampling the customers along with the Imagine SDK to enable them to go into deployment, go into production end of this year and the next year. And so that's a very exciting time where the inference part is now real for the market. It's real, it's real for us. And there's a huge pull from small companies all the way to very large you know, automakers for this kind of solution. We're engaged with them. It's a fantastic pipeline. And so we're really encouraged by the response to our architecture, yeah. response to our, to our tools and, and team. You know, great team of industry veterans, startup veterans, uh, people from academia and machine learning, uh, people from machine learning practices, uh, pure software consultancies. You know, all that comes together. And, you know, it's, it's just an intense environment just from, you know, how you work, the, you know, everybody's here because they believe in the architecture. That's what's really interesting is it's not just a startup addressing AI. It's the, wow, there's something different happening here. And um, I think that that's actually what brought me in too. I love it. Sounds like you're having a lot of fun and you know, I guess what's the right way to say this is as we both get more mature, yeah. um, you want to do something that is is rewarding and is is invigorating. And it sounds like, Chris, at Untether AI, you you found a, just a great uh, opportunity. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for you. And the world needs more competition. I mean, if if what we're witnessing now isn't an absolute exclamation point, you know, whether it's pricing, uh, whether it's efficiency, uh, whether it's total cost of ownership with, with, you know, putting in electricity and form factor and cooling, uh, the world needs more competition. And it sounds like uh, that you're poised to bring that to the, uh, uh, to the edge. Yeah. The, the history of what our participation in uh, the ecosystem has been, the world needs and rewards open source software, innovative new new ideas, new ways of partnership to deliver it. And I think in the AI case, there is the added mandate that we do this, you know, responsibly from a sustainability and an ecological standpoint too, to to make it happen and make it real. And I think that's been a big motivation for why we're founded, why we exist today, and I think why we'll continue to be growing. Thanks for your time, Chris. Hopefully yeah, we can do awesome this again. Time. Yeah, looking forward to many more. So this is uh, Pat Moorhead, Chris Walker. We're talking efficient AI, less power on the edge. You heard it here first. Uh, check out all of our content on our website about Untether AI. And hey, if you want to do the deep dive, go to the Untether AI website out there. Like what you heard, hit that subscribe button. Tell your friends, family, your pets, everybody about this show. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you again.